Hi there. In this video, we're going to try to explain the most common issues we see with household sewing machines when they come into the repair shop, many of which can be remedied at home and or are often user error. So the first thing I'd like to point out are your spool pins. On this machine, you can see we have dual vertical pins. And if you're using a vertical spool, we really need to be using a spool felt. So the felt is going to give the spool a nice smooth surface to pull off of. Now that can be said for the machine itself, but we experience less resistance and less chances of snagging the thread as it pulls off of the spool. Now with that, it's important to know that there's different types of spools. So if you look at this thread, if I could get some light on it. This is considered a cross wound spool and more often than not that's designed to run horizontally. You can use it very successfully on vertical pins. Now this is a stacked spool and as you can see you often run into issues where the thread just wants to fall off of the bottom of the spool. So we can remedy that by using one of these spool nets that are readily available and often pretty inexpensive at your local sewing shop. The biggest issues we see with this type is when someone runs a spool cap smaller than the diameter of the spool itself. Your machine should come with multiple sizes and the rule of thumb is that we want to use a larger cap than our spool of thread. The reason for that is the spool cap provides a smooth surface for the thread to pull off of. Many cheaply made spools often have inconsistencies on the spool itself. So if you look at this spool, I don't know if the camera will focus, but there's a bunch of small inconsistencies around the outside. So if we're using a smaller cap, we increase the likelihood of snagging our thread on the spool itself. So if I continue to rotate it, you'll see that it has a potential to snag the thread. When that happens, you can flex your needle. Your needle could either hit your hook or you could jam your machine. So the rule of thumb is always use a larger cap than the spool itself. Now along with that, a couple other issues we see is we see some people push this cap too far against the spool. When you do that, you could limit the ability for the spool to spin free. When that happens, again, any hesitation of this thread will cause your needle to flex. So if this thread snags for whatever reason, you could again break your needle, jam the machine, throw it at a time, etc. The other issue isn't having this spool cap too far away from your spool. That gives the thread a lot of area before the cap itself that it could potentially get wrapped around and again, cause a needle to flex, jam, throw it at a time, etc. There are times that you may want to use a larger spool than a horizontal pin machine can accommodate. So as you can see, there's plenty of room underneath this spool. But if for some reason your spool was too large and was running into the machine, you wouldn't want to use that spool on this pin. The one real option you have is using a thread stand. So, although we wouldn't often recommend using serger thread on a normal sewing machine, if you wanted to, and with either the vertical pin or the horizontal pin machines, you could use a thread stand. So if you wanted to use this thread, you would then set it on your spool stand, put it behind your machine, basically just bypass this step in threading. So we would continue through our number one guides on either machine. Now, although this is pretty drastic, you may run into situations where your spool, be it serger thread or regular sewing thread, may be too big for a vertical pin, whether it's on a spool stand or a sewing machine. If that's the case, you can often get thread cones or spacers to fill the gap on some of the larger spools to prevent them from shaking. So going back a little bit, not all thread is created equal. And the best analogy we would use 
is gasoline to a car is like thread to your sewing machine. So if you have a high performance vehicle, you wouldn't buy the cheapest gas on the market. And in this case, if you have a, a good quality sewing machine, you don't always want to use the cheapest thread on the market. It's not that it will hurt the machine. It could give you unforeseen issues that will just make sewing more difficult. Look at a cheaply made spool of thread. You have many inconsistencies on the outside of the spool itself. And then quite frankly, the quality is much weaker than something made in Europe or even here in the States. So the next thing we're going to cover is top threading and upper tension. Again, you want to make sure that you have a spool felt underneath your spool if you're running a vertical pin or spool cap larger than your spool if you're running a horizontal pin. Now, to start with tension, there should be a center mark or some sort of indicator for what your tension should be at 99% of the time. In this case, on this machine, it's at five. On other machines, you may have a dot, four or five may be highlighted in a different color to differentiate from the other tensions. Just for example, I've never seen anybody need to use setting zero through two or nine, eight, or seven. Zero through two are just far too little, nine, eight, seven, far too much. So one of the worst things sewing machine companies did, in my opinion, were put these numbers onto the tension mechanisms. Now, if you look at the tension mechanism outside of a machine, you'll see it's just a spring. So the more we increase tension on the spring, the more tension we have. The, when we decrease the tension on the spring, the less tension we have. So to give you an idea, if I roll that tension down to zero, hopefully you can see how loose these discs are. So these are your tension discs. And these are what's applying tension to your upper thread. So you see how loose those are. Now if I roll it up all the way, I can't do that. So look for the center point on your machine. When you're troubleshooting, start there. Don't start high, don't start low. Start at the center point or wherever the factory indicates you should be. Now at this point, as we're coming down through our tension mechanism, or on a machine like this, coming down and around it, it's very important that your presser foot is in the up position. So we need to be threading with our presser foot up. When you lift your presser foot, it releases the tension on your tension discs, which then allow you to put your thread in between these tension discs. If we try to thread with our presser foot down, our thread is highly likely to sit on the outside of the discs, thus giving you zero tension on top, although most people believe it's threaded. So I'll show you a quick way to test top tension. Again, I'm threading with the presser foot up to ensure that we're gonna have tension when it's dropped. So if I get to this point here, I have the end of the thread in my hand. If I put the presser foot down, it doesn't pull freely. If I try to pull on this, there's tension, again, created by the tension mechanism, sealed in place when we drop the presser foot. So that's not moving. We have plenty of tension. Now, for example, if you get to this point and your presser foot is down, we're going to pretend that's down and you grab your thread and it pulls free. It pulls free like that. You have zero tension. You should re-thread being sure that your presser foot is up when you're threading. So now that the machine's threaded, I wanted to show you just a simple sample with two contrasting colors to hopefully explain tension a little more. So I sunk my needle, spinning the hand wheel towards me always. You never want to spin your hand wheel away from you. And I held my thread tails to prevent the tails from pulling back into the machine. So to sew just a quick section, our tension's at the correct position. Now if I lower the tension, if I give it practically no tension, you'll see how drastic it's going to be. So if you see here, 
that's a good looking stitch. If you see over here, there's basically no tension on this bottom thread. So I could pick it out really easily. So what confuses many people is that when we change the upper tension, the results are shown on the bottom. So the best simple analogy I could show you is if we have our top thread, our top thread's coming down and looping around our bottom thread. If we have zero tension up top, it drops down and it doesn't tie a good looking stitch. So oftentimes top tension issues are credited as bobbin issues or bobbin tension issues when in fact it's the top tension. So that's an example of what our bottom thread would look like. That section there, if we have zero top tension. So now we're going to go the opposite way. We'll sew a good quality stitch. Again, sending that tension back to our center point. Now I'm going to increase the top tension just for an example. So this section here, again, is a good quality stitch. This section over here, the top tension is way too tight. If you look at these blue dots, they shorten up and it's pulling to the top side. So it's far too much tension on top. So if we were to balance the tension out again, we're looking for a good even stitch on both sides. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to illustrate what it looks like when you miss your take-up lever. Your take-up lever essentially pulls the slack out of each stitch. We have to provide the thread with some slack in order to tie the stitch, and then we need to get rid of that slack. On a sewing machine, your take-up lever ju does just that. So again, don't do this on purpose, but what I did is I threaded it improperly through the tension mechanism, bypassing the take-up lever, which you see here. So I, again, don't do this to your machine. It's not worth it. But you'll see after just a few stitches, the machine's jammed. So in order to unjam it, I'm gonna make sure the take-up lever is in the highest position. I'm gonna lift up the presser foot in this case, I can't pull it free. In some rare cases, you can. So on a front loading machine, I'm gonna open the bottom door, pull down the race, grab the bobbin case and the hook. So that is what happens if we miss the take-up lever. All of that is our top thread. And again, what happened was our take-up lever wasn't there to pull the slack out of each one of those stitches. So essentially each loop you see is a stitch that just wasn't tied properly. So to finish unjamming a front loading machine, I'm gonna make sure I clear the threads. You can take your hook and you could feel the outside of the hook for any type of burrs or imperfections. That's why a front loading machine is really user friendly. If you created a burr on this hook as a result of a needle strike, you could buff it off with a little emery cloth or a nail file, put a slight amount of oil, just a drop of oil on this backside, clear it out, 
put the residual oil from your fingers onto that pin and then reinstall it. So what I'm doing to reinstall it is essentially lining up this crescent shape with this crescent shape piece here. So we set it in there. You can then flip your race cover up. At this point, what I recommend doing is clearing your top thread and giving the hand wheel a spin. Again, just get in the habit of spinning it towards you. So it's nice and free. That needle should be okay. But we would recommend that if you jam your machine, just replace your needle right away. It's not worth creating bigger issues. There's two types of bobbin loading. We have front loading, like this machine, and we have top loading, like this machine. Now these machines, top loading sewing machines, often offer wider stitch capability and more built-in stitches. But the biggest issue with this type of system is the bobbin case itself. So if we look at a top loading bobbin case, most of the time on modern machines, they're plastic. If you look at the bobbin case on 99.9% .9 of front loading machines, they're metal. So if we created a burr on the hook, or in this case, the bobbin case, when we jammed it, we can buff that off and often alleviate the problem. With a top loading case, if you look closely on this one here, you'll see spots where the needle actually punctured the case. If that happens, you really can't buff it. It's almost a guaranteed replacement. Now these are often not too expensive, starting as cheap as $15, but at times can go well over 50. So, although this machine can sew a wider stitch than this machine, I feel as though this machine is a more user-friendly machine. Now, if we look at the bobbin case on this machine, you'll see that this spring here is actually our tension spring. Now bobbin case tension is hardly ever adjusted. There are a few easy ways to test your bobbin tension, one of which is to get the thread underneath the string. And oftentimes people want you to be able to hold the bobbin case with the thread. That's often a good sign of tension. Now, obviously, if you have too much tension, it'll do the same thing. So it does take some finesse. Now, the small screw here where we adjust our bobbin case tension, if you're going to adjust that, I would recommend turning that at less than a quarter turn per adjustment. You can make a small turn, put it in the machine, test it, and continue to do so until your bobbin tension is set properly. There's a common misconception online that the direction of your bobbin will play a pivotal role in your stitch quality. Now, although it can, it's really not as big of an issue as the internet has made it out to be. So I would definitely recommend threading your machine properly. So just consult your owner's manual. A small trick that we've learned is if you look at this bobbin case, or if we grab the bobbin case for a friend's machine or machine we're not familiar with and we look at it, you can kind of see how this piece here, right where our thread goes in, to me, that angle, if you put it, an invisible line off of the middle of it, almost looks like an arrow. So t that's telling me that this spool should spin in the same direction as that small little arrow that that piece comes to. So in this machine in particular, we want it to spin clockwise. Again, if I put this in backwards and sewed with it, it'll sew and it won't hurt the machine. So if you're familiar with threading a top loading machine and you borrow a friend's front loading machine, they thread essentially the same, but rather than taking this out, we're putting our bobbin inside. So if this was the same machine, again, if we look on the, on the inside, you could kind of see how that little point comes to an arrow. That would tell me that the bobbin needs to spin in that direction.
So this is very clearly the wrong bobbin for this machine. But I could drop it in just to show you that if we put this in and threaded it, that arrow rule, imaginary arrow rule, applies here as well. So again, if we had this in wrong and sewed with it, it's not the end of the world. Now another issue we see is people come into the shop and ask for universal bobbins or pre-wound bobbins that'll work. Unfortunately, there is not a universal bobbin. It just doesn't exist. So for this drop-in bobbin machine, you'll see that the bobbin itself is much smaller than this front-loading machine. These are not interchangeable. You have to use the proper bobbin for your machine. Now some stores will sell universal style bobbins, but oftentimes that refers to either class 15 or class 66 bobbins, which in and of themselves are not interchangeable. So just try to find the proper bobbin for your machine. So at this point in threading, I'm ready to pull the bobbin thread to the top. So it's very important, again, that you always spin the hand wheel towards you. So if we have a hold of our top thread, spin the hand wheel towards us, one full revolution. If you think of revolutions as this take-up lever going all the way down and all the way back up, the stitch is tied at the highest point and the revolution is complete. So now I could grab whatever's handy and pull the loop of the bobbin thread through the needle plate. At this point, what we would recommend anybody do before they take off sewing, rather than just pushing on the foot pedal, we would recommend sinking your needle. Now on this machine, it's computerized or it has a heel click, so we could sink the needle in one fell swoop. In most machines, we would recommend holding on to your thread tails, turning the hand wheel towards you until the needle sunk. Now, to hopefully illustrate why we would want to hold on to our thread tails, I'm going to pull these threads and I'm going to cut them even with this plate. Actually, I'll do it on the outside here just to give you an idea. So if we had thread in here and we went to sew, the machine expects to use thread from the top and from the bottom. It does not no, and it doesn't expect more thread coming in from the side. So our threads are almost here on the edge. And if I start to turn that, you'll see that the threads start to suck back into the machine. So A, the top thread's being pulled up, and B, the bottom thread's being pulled down. So now we have a total of four sources of our thread. So oftentimes people run into jamming issues when they don't hold their thread tails. When it comes to sinking your needle, it can help with deflection. So deflections when your needle hits your material, deflects and hits your hook and or your needle plate and or your bobbin case. So if at all possible, before you start a seam, just sink your needle. If you can get into the habit of spinning your hand wheel towards you at all times, holding your thread tails and sinking your needles will greatly reduce the odds of you running into sewing issues with your household machine. Sometimes we'll get a call and someone will have just spent good money on a new machine or getting their machine fixed. They'll get their machine home, they'll set it up, they'll get it threaded properly, do everything we've taught them and everything they've learned in their sewing career. Then they'll go to step on the foot pedal and nothing happens. Oftentimes there's some sort of whirring or the machine sounds as though it's trying to run, but nothing's happening. Oftentimes there's two issues that are at play. Sometimes it could be something as simple as a bobbin winder, or other times with machines in which you have to disengage the hand wheel to wind your bobbin, the hand wheel may be loose, so the bobbin winder is running, essentially running your bobbin winder and not your machine. So make sure that your hand wheel, if applicable, is tightened and that your bobbin winder is not on. Another thing we see time to time is we'll get a phone call that a customer's machine is not feeding their material. They'll roll their stitch length up to as high as it'll go, they'll push on the foot pedal, and the material won't feed. 
often it's something as simple as being in darning or free motion mode rather than normal sewing mode. When you're in normal sewing mode, your feed dogs are going to come up through the needle plate and move your material, both in sewing forward and reverse. So to use this as an opportunity, sometimes people will get to this point. They'll start to pull on their material and their material seems as though it's jammed. So if we look at the machine right now, this material is not loose and the tape lever is in our lowest position. So if we spin our hand wheel towards us, again, always towards us, until that take up lever is in the highest position, it'll finish off that last stitch and it'll release your material. Another tip we like to provide is that if you're trying to dial in your tension settings, the best stitch to dial it to is a four millimeter long by four millimeter wide zigzag. So if we set our machine to zigzag and we increase our stitch length and width to four millimeters, and so it'll give us a good idea of what our tension's like and if we need to make any further adjustment. So in this case, that tension looks good and we could stop there. Thanks for watching. If you guys have any questions, please leave them in the comments and we'll be sure to try to address every single one of them. And if you guys have any requests for videos, let us know. So thank you for your feedback and hope this helps.